Thief are in listen only mode. Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Navigating Oncology Trials in Asia, How a Regional CRO Can Deliver on a Global Project. My name is Vicky and I will be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes with time for a question and answer session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. If you do require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. And at this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. At this point, I would like to thank Novatech, who helped develop the content for this presentation. Established in 1996, Novatech is the largest independent Australia-based CRO. With headquarters in Sydney and operations in 12 countries, Novatech's wide geographic coverage throughout the Asia-Pacific region makes it particularly well-placed as a mid-sized CRO to meet the clinical outsourcing requirements of the biotechnology industry. Novatech's presence on the ground in key countries such as Australia, China, Hong Kong, India, South Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand have been instrumental in making key contribution to a significant number of pivotal U.S. FDA studies. This has in turn led to a growing list of now marketed products in fields such as oncology, rheumatology, and neuromuscular diseases. Most recently, Novatech's service offering has come to be recognized by Frost & Sullivan as a category winner in the CRO Best Practice Award, an award the company has won for the third time in recent years. And now, I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Our first speaker is Dr. John Mahler. Prior to joining Novatech, John was a managing director of IVF Australia and a director of the parent company, Virtus Health. John was previously a management consultant with the Boston Consulting Group and partners in performance specializing in supporting private equity transactions and implementing growth and operational improvement initiatives. In addition to his medical qualifications, John also holds a Master's of Business Administration degree from the University of Oxford and a Bachelor of Arts in Advanced Logic from University of Canterbury. And our next speaker for today is Donna Fraser. Due to unexpected circumstances, Donna Fraser, Associate Director of Client Operations, will be presenting the section today for Andrea Jeffrey. And our last speaker for today is Chin Wee Tan. Chin Wee provides management oversight and leadership to, to a team of experienced SCRAs and CRA and support staff. He works closely with the feasibility team and ensures that clinical trials are conducted according to all applicable good clinical practice guidelines, regulatory requirements, standard, standard operating procedures, and the project agreement. Chin Wee brings more than seven years of clinical experience to the role, joining Novatech in 2014. He has previously held senior positions at regional and global CROs. Chin Wee graduated from the National University of Singapore with a Bachelor of Pharmacy. And now, without further ado, I would like to hand the mic over to our speakers. They may begin when ready. Thank you, Vicky, and I'd like to welcome all participants to the call. As a brief introduction to Novatech, we were established in 1996, so we turned 20 this year. We have over 300 staff, and we have a physical presence in 12 countries, including nine countries in Asia. Our Greater China operation includes a physical presence in Hong Kong, China, and Taiwan. Our strategy in terms of our regional expansion has been to establish a physical office 
with senior local country leaders and full-time local office-based staff. We've elected to grow organically rather than by acquisition to ensure that the broad skill base and our focus on quality that we, that we see as core parts of Novatech's culture aren't diluted as we grow. I'm based in Singapore, but I visit one of our Asia offices every week to ensure that we grow as a single company and that the required resources and infrastructure are in place to support our quality requirements. When we look at the cancer burden in Asia, Asia contributes 44% of worldwide cancer cases each year and 51% of cancer deaths. The higher death rate is due to poorer access to treatment in many Asian countries. Clinical trials can provide an important means for patients in Asia to access innovative treatments and many clinical trial candidates in Asia will be treatment naive. The top three cancers in women in Asia are breast, lung, and cervical, and in men, lung, stomach, and liver cancer. In the West, colorectal is also in the top three for both sexes, and prostate is in the top three for men. We now have a quick poll question, um, and if you'd like to take the opportunity to answer this one. Thanks for that, Dr. Mahler. So we do have a quick poll question for the audience today. And that question is, have you or your company conducted an oncology clinical trial in Asia in the past two years? And the answers we have are yes and no. So if the audience could please get their answers in, the poll will be closing shortly. And once again, I'll just repeat the question. And the question is, have you or your company conducted an oncology clinical trial in Asia in the past two years? And unfortunately, the poll is coming to a close. And I will go ahead and share those answers with the audience. So 57% of the audience voted for yes. They have conducted an oncology clinical trial in Asia in the past two years. And 43% of the audience voted no. So Dr. Mahler, I'll pass the presentation back to you. As we can see in this slide, Asia initiated about two-thirds of the number of oncology trials as the US, despite having 14 times the population. Again, this suggests that with clinical trials in Asia, you are more likely to be able to recruit treatment-naive patients or have less likelihood of encountering trial conflict. At Novatec, we pay very close attention to disease incidents by country, which is clearly an important part of our country selection process during feasibility. And we're showing China here as an example. The incidence of most diseases in China is actually falling within the range of high income pharmaceutical consuming countries, which is generally useful for clinical trials. There are, however, pockets of high disease incidence in various Asian countries which can also benefit a number of our clients in specific therapeutic areas. In China, for example, and you'll see these highlighted areas, there is a much higher incidence of stomach, liver, and esophageal cancer. Asia also has an ethnically, ethnically diverse population. I won't go through the details of each country here, but accessing this diversity will become increasingly important as incomes and pharmaceutical consumption continues to grow in the region. The scale of hospitals and the quality of infrastructure in Asia is incredibly impressive, particularly in large cities where you can see hospitals with, with up to, with up to 4,000 beds and hospital networks including six to 8,000 beds. The McKinsey Global Institute predicts that by 2025, 310 of the world's top 600 cities will be in Asia, and this metropolitan scale allows the development of large high-tech hospitals who are able to invest in sophisticated clinical trial infrastructure. Finally, clinical trial quality is very high in Asia. In terms of FDA data, Asia has a lower rate of official actions indicated and voluntary actions indicated than the US itself. 
I'd now like to hand over to Chin Wee Tan, one of our clinical operations leaders who will take us through some of the operational considerations of conducting oncology trials in Asia. Thank you, John. A very good morning, everyone. I am Chin Wee, Clinical Operations Manager based in Singapore. I'll be touching on some of the operational considerations when conducting oncology trials in Asia. In this slide, you will see some important operational considerations we have put together, namely relationship with sites and investigators, site identification, experience with local vendors, translations, cultural differences, standard of care, and ethnic differences. Let us now take a look at the relationship we and Novotech have with our sites and investigators. As you can see from the graph below, Novotech have worked with 80% of the top 50 investigators and 92% of the top 20 sites. Site identification. So what kind of site do we look for so that we can have a reasonable amount of confidence that they can give us the patient numbers? One, teaching hospitals. Typically, these are major referral centers with comprehensive range of medical, surgical, and dental specialties. Two, we look for sites with strong research focus or those with integrated research units. This means that they have the infrastructure and capabilities to support the conduct of any phase one to four clinical trials. And also, they will have the essential equipment and facilities in place to do so. Three, we will look for major oncology centers or sites with extensive clinical trial experience. And of course, those with leading KOLs. Some Asian KOLs are highly regarded internationally that they even stand in the steering committee for the sponsor's drug development program. Very importantly, sites will need to have sufficient site staff that are GCP trained and have many years of clinical trial experience. Last but not least, the selected sites need to have proven track records of meeting enrollment targets on time. Another thing to consider will be experience with local vendors. Early identification and engagement and setup of required vendors is very important. Vendors like the central lab, IXRS, which is in charge of drug supply and management, IP storage and distribution depots are all essential parts of a clinical trial. An example will be the use of a local depot in one of our vaccine trials in Thailand. This enabled temperature sensitive vaccines to be sent to our six sites throughout the country, and Thailand contributed 60 patients in this study. With local expertise in our countries, we are able to advise on suitable and reliable vendors qualified by, by our very own robust internal vendor assurance process to do our translation tasks. More often than not, we have consulting agreements in place with agreed rates. Additionally, we have the luxury of local team members who can assist to follow up and communicate with the vendors directly on the ground. Now, I would like to touch on translations. Several of our APEC countries, such as China, South Korea, Taiwan, will require translation on essential documents, such as the protocol, investigator's brochure, summary of the protocol, patient-related materials, and some even site contracts. Depending on the turnaround time for our translation vendor, site review and internal translation verification, finalization of translated patient-related materials can take two to three weeks. Amendment can impact on study timelines significantly. The table below shows the translation requirements for our country. As you will probably know by now, Translation is vital and needs to be taken into consideration right from the initial planning stage. 
Next, I will touch on some cultural differences. Time zone. Time difference exists between Europe, US, and Asia. This is important for the scheduling of teleconferences and meetings. A meeting scheduled in the afternoon of Friday in the US time will be Saturday morning for Asia. Languages. It is important to note that English is not the first language for majority of Asian countries. Mandarin and other dialects are spoken. In Hong Kong, for example, although English is widely spoken, study coordinator and principal investigators will feel more at home and open up to you more if you are able to converse in Cantonese. In many countries in Asia, patients' decision to participate in a clinical trial is made in consultation with family members. Informed consent will be signed after several days of discussion with the family. In the presence of the necessary witnesses, legally acceptable representatives, and impartial witnesses as required. Here in Asia, doctors are generally held in very high regard, and so patients listen a lot to doctors. And so, if the doctor is convinced and confident of the molecule, it is likely that the trial will recruit well. In some countries like Taiwan and Korea, it is the industry expectation that CRAs have lunch with the study coordinators and sponsor pays for lunch. This cultural norm is unusual in the US and Europe context, but can be arranged and discussed at study startup with the client. Face-to-face -face meetings with investigators. Investigators in Asia generally prefer face-to-face -face communication rather than email. Another thing that you will need to consider is the standard of care in the particular country you want to run your trial in. Differences in the standard of care can impact our trials. One example will be for a hearing loss trial we have in Thailand. Thailand is the second highest recruiter globally. This trial requires a special procedure to be carried out, intral tympanic injection, and this is done routinely in Thailand and the specialists are very familiar with this procedure. Local custom may undermine clinical trial results. A good example will be in China. Herbal medicines account for around one third of the country's pharmaceutical sales. This means a vast majority of our patients might have taken traditional Chinese medicine, which is highly probable to have interactions with our therapies. As such, there will need to be diligent questioning in the screening process to get a complete past medical history of our patients. Ethnic differences. Ethnic variations in drug metabolism and hence clinical efficacy and side effect profiles do exist, but are the exception rather than the norm. A well-known example is warfarin where Chinese patients may require a dose nearly 40% lower than Caucasian patients due to ethnic variation in the cytochrome P450 coding gene. Also, Asian patients appear to be less tolerant to chemotherapy. Different docetaxel doses are commonly administered in different geographic populations. In Caucasian, the common starting dose of first-line single-agent docetaxel is 100 mg per meter square. While in Asian countries such as China and Korea, the common starting dose is 70 to 75 mg per meter square. In Japan, the approved starting dose for docetaxel is 60 mg per meter square. Despite these reduced doses, Asians have higher reported febrile neutropenia rates compared to Caucasian. The FDA has, de has therefore provided guidance on demographic coding in clinical trials and as well as guidance on which drugs could be ethnically sensitive and the types of bridging studies that may be required. However, it should be noted that some ethnic variation may not be identified until post-marketing because ethnic variation in gene expression may be quite subtle. I will now take you through the current regulatory process and timeline for Asian countries. These are actually average timelines based on Novotech's own first-hand experience and might differ from what is published by the regulators. Other factors that need to be taken into consideration will be the contract execution time, which is at least two weeks. 
In this table, you will see Taiwan, Hong Kong, Thailand, and Korea. With the exception of Thailand, all the other countries, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Korea, have a parallel regulatory, uh, regulatory and ethics review process. For both Hong Kong and Korea, import license is applied after regulatory approval. With the exception of Hong Kong, all the other countries require import license for medical supplies. As you can see, the startup timeline for these four countries is around four to five months. On this slide, you will see the timeline for Malaysia, Singapore, India, and Philippines. Again, they all have parallel ethics committee and regulatory authority review process. Also, import license is required for all countries. The startup timeline for these four countries is around five to six months. It is good to note that CTA negotiation in Singapore can take up to six months. This is because established sites have fixed unit costs and line items which are non-negotiable during budget discussion. You can also see that for the Philippines, the regulatory timeline is slightly longer than six months compared to the official published timeline of three to four months. However, the Philippines regulatory authorities are in the midst of reform and streamlining the various processes and we hope to see this timeline being reduced to the published timeline in the next one to two years. Lastly, I will touch on China. In this slide, you can see that China takes around 18 months for approval for a chemical entity and around 24 months for biologicals. This is due to the huge backlog in review process. New regulations by the Chinese government mandates foreign sponsors to apply for approval from the Human Genetic Resources Administrative Office to run trials in the region. The State Council has proposed a deadline for eliminating the backlog of applications by the end of 2016, which would significantly speed up approval timeline. On top of, on top of this, several initiatives have been introduced, such as adding products into fast-track approval queues, enhancing the consistency of the agency's technical requirements, improved communications with the applicant, improved transparency by publishing review in CFDA websites, and of course, more package and dossier reviewers are being recruited. We have seen in recent months for global studies, especially oncology, that the CFDA is promising and in fact has already started providing clinical trial approval within six to 10 months. That is like one to two years faster than before. We now have the second poll question. Thank you for that, Chinwe. So that is correct. We have another poll question for the audience right now. And that poll question is, is your company planning to conduct an oncology trial in Asia in the next one to two years? So if the audience could please get their answers in, the poll will be closing shortly. And the answers we have here for the audience are yes, no, still deciding, or I don't know. And I will just repeat the poll question one more time. And the poll question is, is your company planning to conduct an oncology trial in Asia in the next one to two years? And this poll question is coming to an end. So I will go ahead and share those answers with the audience. So 38% of the audience voted for yes, 13% voted for no, and 25% both voted for still deciding and I don't know. So now I would like to pass the presentation over to Donna. Thank you very much, Vicki. Just uh, getting my slides ready here. Just trying to get it into full screen mode. Apologize for the delay. So hello everybody and thank you Chin Wee. Uh, my name is Donna Fraser and I'm here today to represent Andrea Jeffrey who is a senior project manager at Novatech. Andrea is based in our Melbourne office and she is responsible for managing this project. 
I would now like to take you through an example of an oncology project we are currently working on. We have had a lot of challenges with the study, but also an, a lot of successes. The study itself is a global phase three registration study in metastatic breast cancer. There are 26 sites, excuse me, there are 26 countries involved in the study around the world, including North and South America, Europe, and Asia PAC. In Asia PAC, we have five countries participating. Those are Australia, Hong Kong, South Korea, Singapore, and Taiwan. We have 42 sites spread across these five countries. We need to enroll 600 patients into the study globally, and we are actively enrolling at the moment. The study first came to us as a rescue study, and it was already in the early stages of feasibility and startup. However, the sponsor was not happy with the performance of their current CRO, so they moved the study across to Novatech to manage the Asia PAC portion of the study. As such, it came to us in a very big hurry with very limited time for preparation or planning. The study itself is a reasonably complicated oncology protocol. It has some particular complex inclusion exclusion criteria which make identifying potential patients quite challenging. There are two other global CROs responsible for managing the study in Europe and Asia, and there are, another, there are a number of other vendors and CROs responsible for other various aspects of the study management, for example, pharmacovigilance and data management. At the time the study came to us, approximately 20 sites had already been approved for participation, and these sites had been selected by the previous CRO. Some were in quite a staggered startup, and uh, this had an impact on bringing these countries and sites on board. In addition to all of the above, the sponsor made it very clear to Novatech at the time of transition that they had very clear set timelines that they were working to, and they weren't prepared to accept any delays due to the change in CRO. We were expected to be able to meet the timelines previously agreed to by the outgoing CRO. On this next slide, I would like to list some of the key considerations that sponsors need to consider when selecting a CRO partner for their oncology studies. Firstly, the importance of well-established local teams. At Novatech, we have permanent full-time Novatech CRAs on the ground in each of our countries with a wide variety of oncology experience. We have therefore built a high profile of country-specific expertise. That means we are able to quickly identify the key sites and the PIs that you need to be looking for for your study. In this case, we were looking for breast cancer specialists, and we were immediately able to identify high-profile high oncology centers and key contacts within these sites that had not been previously approached by the, for the study. At the time we took on the project, we immediately started regular internal team calls, not only with our local country team, but also with the other relevant departments within Novatech so that everybody was clear on their roles and responsibilities, the timelines we were all working to, and we were all kept fully informed. This is critically important, particularly in the early stages of the study, where we, are sometimes, when we were sometimes meeting two or three times a week. At the same time, we set up regular direct communication with our sponsor to keep them fully informed of our progress. And we also set up meetings with some of the other relevant vendors so they were able to stay on the same page. One of the key components in managing this study in particular was to maintain a very flexible and proactive approach to, many, to the many changes and challenges as they arose. We have frequently received feedback from our sponsor on how flexible we are when it comes to being proactive as circumstances change. As well as keeping our sponsor informed, 
We also need to be able to identify potential issues and obstacles as they come up and also be able to offer contingencies or potential options for managing these situations. And again, we rely on our local expertise to assist with this. On this next slide, I'd like to just summarize the progress we have made since taking over the study. As I have said, it is very important to, be, has, to have a very clear understanding from our sponsor of their expectations, including their timelines, right from the start. We had to quickly come up to speed on the current status of the project, including all the current challenges that so we were able to prioritize and plan accordingly. This also meant we were able to resource the study appropriately right from the start. We quickly identified well-recognized KOLs in the region and brought on additional sites with good recruitment potential. We had a number of our senior team members, most of them our local country managers, go out on site with the CRAs. Uh, and this was employed, the strategy was employed in Korea in particular and in some of our other countries. Very important to keep this in mind for feasibilities and site initiation visits. While it's not unusual for this to happen, uh, particularly for senior or very important PIs, in this case, because there had been a change in CRO, we felt it was important to reassure the site during that period of change and maintain a positive relationship with them. We established and maintained clear communication within our Novatech team, but also with our sponsor, the other CROs, the vendors, and of course, very importantly, with our sites. We assigned an oncology experience CRA team for this project. In particular, we assigned an additional PM resource based in Asia. This has proven to be particularly successful. Our Asian PM has co-attended visits with our CRAs, conducted additional training as required, and has been able to meet and converse with a lot of our PIs in the local language. We put a lot of effort into keeping our communication open with our sites so that they have this study in the forefront of their minds and are fully aware of the protocol requirements, particularly during the screening and the randomization period, which as we all know can be a very busy and challenging time. We have a number of sites that have already met their recruitment target. So we are working with these sites to keep their engagement and momentum going. And we also have a number of low enrolling sites. So we continue to work with these sites to understand their challenges and to work through various options with them. We have maintained our open communication with our sponsor, including several face-to-face -face meetings not only with the sponsor, but also with the other regional CROs. We are constantly working to keep our sites and our CROs engaged and motivated. And we have repeated feedback from the sponsor about the positive attitude and great teamwork that we see in our Novatech team. We have continued to keep a flexible approach to how we respond to new changes. And we always need to remember that we are acting on behalf of the sponsor in, their, in our region. A lot of our sponsors may be venturing into Asia for the first time and are wanting to establish a presence in the region and establish relationships with our PIs and sites. The Novatech team are often your eyes and ears and voice on the ground across these countries. And we take that responsibility very seriously. So this is the final slide to summarize where we are as of today. The enrollment rate globally is continuing to increase with Asia-Pac outperforming all other regions. Around one third of the patients enrolled to date have come from Asia-Pac and our sponsor has commented on several occasions that Asia-Pac has really surpassed their expectations. We recognized very early on that Taiwan was looking like a high recruiting country for us. So we went back and did some additional feasibility in this region and doubled our site numbers in Taiwan, predominantly to increase the recruitment potential. 
Taiwan is now the highest enrolling country globally, with 59 patients enrolled to date. Based on our proven performance and positive relationship with our sponsor, we have now been asked to conduct feasibility and site startup activities in China, and we are very excited to be able to bring this important country into the study. That's all I wanted to cover with you today regarding my project. We will now have another poll question, and then I will hand, things, hand the presentation back to John. Thank you for that, Donna. So that, that is correct. We have one last poll question here, and that question is, if planning an oncology trial in Asia, what do you consider to be the most compelling reason for doing so? And the answers we have here are access to greater patient pool to expedite enrollment, good availability of KOLs with a strong oncology expertise, or a regional CRO with established site relationships. So if the audience could please get their answers in, the poll will be closing shortly. And I'll just go ahead and repeat that question one more time. So the poll question is, if planning an oncology trial in Asia, what do you consider to be the most compelling reason for doing so? So this poll will be closing, and I will go ahead and share the answers with the audience. So it looks like 57% of the audience voted for access to a greater patient pool to expedite enrollment, then 29% voted for good availability of KOLs with strong oncology expertise, and lastly, 14% voted for a regional CRO with established site relationships. So now I would like to pass the presentation over to John uh, for some closing remarks. Many thanks, Vicky, and, and many thanks for that section, Donna. Just to recap, Asia is an exceptional region of the world for conducting oncology trials. We have the world's largest patient pool with very high enrollment potential. So there's access to patients in countries with quite a low healthcare spend where innovative oncology treatments really are a very important part of the healthcare landscape. You'll often find treatment naive patients, and patient participation and compliance is particularly high in Asia. Asia presents an important future consumer market, which is very important to many of our biotech clients, who while they may not be intending to market their, um, their products in Asia itself, um, they certainly are looking um, for potential future requirers that will have an eye on Asia. There's a much lower trial cost per patient compared to the US and European Union, and we estimate that the pass-through costs can be 30 to 60% lower in Asia than the US. As we've seen, there's some very sophisticated clinical trial infrastructure, particularly in some of the large Asian megacities, and clinical trial quality is also extremely high. I'd now like to cover some of the partner and operating considerations that you may like to think about in general when thinking about oncology trials in Asia. Firstly, does your CRO have a wide geographical presence in the region? Asia is not a not an homogenous region. All the countries are very, very different indeed. Does your CRO have broad experience with oncology trials, which as we know, can be highly complex. Is there a strategic fit between the size of the CRO and the client? We are firm believers that mid-sized biotech firms get a higher level of service from mid-sized CROs where the relationship is economically important to the CRO and the CRO can have the level of flexibility and responsiveness required by biotech firms. Can the CRO demonstrate operational performance across all trial phases? And does the CRO have senior in-country staff with good access to KOLs, sites, and regulators? This is important throughout Asia where the strength and longevity of relationships is important in any professional or business relationship. 
does the CRO focus on quality people with high levels of English and technical training? We think it's very important to invest in permanent offices in each of our locations, which we believe is an important part of developing a consistent company culture, providing training and coaching opportunities as well as providing quality oversight. Do the project managers have multi-country experience? This is critical as differences in process timelines between countries, languages, time zones and regulatory environments add a whole new layer of complexity to project management. Does the CRO have a comprehensive quality system that will meet your aspirations as you grow? Does your CRO have the flexibility to provide some or all of the service components that you require and potentially work with your other partners in other regions? And does your CRO have technology infrastructure that is scalable and universally recognised? That brings us to the end of our formal presentation um, and I'd like to thank you all very much for your participation. I'd now like to open the floor to questions but we are also very happy to respond to your emails if you have any questions that you would like addressed later. Perfect, thank you for that John. So. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for those insightful presentations. Now, I would like to invite our audience to continue to send in their questions or comments right now using the questions window for the Q&A portion of this webinar. So far, we have already received some questions, so I will begin with those. So the first question here is for uh, Dr. Mahler. How does quality in oncology trials in Asia compare to other regions? Thanks for that, Vicky. Um, look, as mentioned in my opening section, at a very high level, investigators in Asia have a lower rate of official actions imposed by the US FDA than the US, than the US itself, and a much higher rate of no actions indicated. We've got experience with audits from a range of regulators, including the FDA, um, the EMA, MFDS in Korea, the DCGI in India, and the HSA in Singapore, and none of these audits have had critical findings. At Novatec, we've also got really good visibility into quality metrics at an operational level where we are sometimes the lead CRO with partners in other regions. And as an example, in a recent glioblastoma study, Asia had about 55% faster resolution of open queries. Um, Asia Pacific was the first and only reg region to achieve 100% survival data sweep, 100% data entry and zero open qu queries, all within time frames at the point of um, the interim analysis. There are probably a number of reasons for this very high level of quality performance in Asia and this includes a real focus in Asia on technical education. There are very high levels of respect accorded to the medical profession and hence compliance to medical requirements during clinical trials. And there's a real desire and cultural um, imperative not to lose faith, particularly to international observers. Perfect, thank you for that, Dr. Mahler. So the next question here is for Chin Wee. So you mentioned in your presentation about the importance of obtaining an informed consent from the patient once they've had sufficient time to discuss with family and legal representatives. Can you offer any good advice on how to best achieve this outcome? Thanks, Vicky. Okay, um, so as with all studies, it is very important to make the PIs and their staff, site staff uh, to make sure that they have a complete understanding of the protocol and how the study will be conducted. At Novotech, we conduct thorough site training to ensure that we achieve this. And once the site fully understand the study, they are better equipped to speak to the patients and address their questions. Uh, also, allowing sufficient time for patients and their families is also very important. And uh, we usually encourage our investigators to send the informed consent home with the patient uh, as this can help with uh, the informed consent process as well. Also, we will encourage our sites to allow sufficient time at the screening visit um, so that they have uh, 
more time and the patient will have more time. And uh, finally, I think uh, making sure that sites can be flexible with their time and appointment uh, also ensure that uh, we have better informed patient and eventually it leads to better compliance and a higher likelihood that these patients will stay in the study until the, the last study visit. Well, that was a great answer, Tinui. Thank you. So the next question we have here is for Donna. Uh, site selection is a key component to the su success you are having with your recruitment on your breast cancer study. How did you achieve this? And can you give us a better understanding of the strategies you use to select the sites you chose? Thank you, Vicki. That's an excellent question. Um, site selection, I think, is largely about um, good site selection is about having the experience and the level of confidence um, to know that investigators, which investigators to approach. Um, and we have this by having local staff in each of our countries. Uh, our staff have well established relationships and we know that this process works uh, exceptionally well. Um, at Novatech, our country managers are very involved in our feasibility process. They have a clear understanding of the local environment, um, competing trials, the standard of care uh, across their region, and also the capabilities of the sites that we're considering. Um, understanding which sites um, will be able to complete the feasibility questionnaire via email uh, is important, and which ones are going to require an on-site visit. Um, Face-to-face -face visits for feasibility visits um, is not uncommon across many countries in Asia. Many of our um, KOLs have a strong interest in the science behind the study and they very much want to be involved very early on. Um, one of the things we, we see at Novatech frequently is investigators who are keen to be involved in the study design and many of them like to help our sponsors to refine their inclusion and exclusion criteria and to help design their protocols. At the same time, um, we also think it's very important not to overload our sites. Um, we try not to approach them too frequently, and I think that's, that's um, another example of how we show local respect uh, for their time and their resources. Um, just one other point. Novatech have built a reputation for turning around site questions very quickly. And again, this is important during your feasibility process uh, to keep the site engaged um, in what you're trying to achieve. Um, we consistently get back to our sites and we don't um, select um, that we don't select as well. That's another important um, factor. Um, and again, this shows our respect for their time and their input. Um, I think it's important to understand from a sponsor perspective that not all studies are right for all sites, uh, and that's okay. Um, but I think all these strategies speak to our local knowledge and the strong relationships we have for our Asian sites. Perfect. Thank you for that, Donna. So I would like to thank all of our speakers very much for those insightful answers as well. Unfortunately, we have reached the end of the Q&A portion for this webinar. If you have any further questions or your questions were not answered during the Q&A portion, you can always email our speakers here at the following email addresses. And thank you everyone for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from X Talks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up shortly on your screen and your participation is greatly appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now, please join us in thanking our speakers, Dr. John Mahler, Chin Wee Tan, and Donna Fraser. We hope you have found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.